Good morning, everybody. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Daniel chapter 8. This is a bit of a complicated uh, chapter, and it's going to get pretty deep into prophecy. And it's very important to understand before we get into the rest of Daniel. Now, first of all, I had, I, I had to sit down and do a translation of it myself because some of the Hebrew words used in it can be translated in a few different manners and I wanted to see the dynamics of that on how on what what is in there that, that so that we can talk about how it could be translated because oftentimes you'll find that uh, people have uh, assumptions and presuppositions uh, when they're translating, especially the in the old days. So we'll go through that and look at some aspects of the translation. So here's a picture of a Hebrew Bible, the section of, this is the very end of Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 9 starts here. So uh, now you can see how the text was arranged it's kind of like a poem or something at the end of the chapter. So what I did was when I made my translation, I arranged it in such a way that it reflects that. So now I divided it into paragraphs, as you can see, which is not in the Hebrew, but it's just in the English um, where the paragraphs kind of make sense. I, made, I divided it up a bit. And then at the end here, that's where I did this part here, tabbed it in like this, and it kind of reflects that end part of Daniel to see like where the Hebrew authors uh, rearranged the text, where they uh, rearranged it like this here, why they did that. And we'll see why that, it's it sort of, what it does is, so they'll do that one when it's poetry, or when they want to focus on a certain part of the of the narrative that is very important. And that part is the little horn where they do that, which is very interesting. So let's start with uh, just reading the translation that I made here. And this is like a literal, it's a very literal translation. Because we want to know what these symbols mean and what's going on here. So we don't need any suppositions brought into it or, or any uh, explanation pre-explained for us. We want to literally know what it says. Okay, in the third year of Belshazzar, the king, this is the king of Babylon, remember? The last king, the one that was drinking the wine out of, the, out of God's uh, vessels. Uh, this is his third year. And remember it was in the first year of Belshazzar that Daniel had his previous vision in chapter 7 of the four uh, beasts on, on the great sea. Now this is the third year, two years later. Okay, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the vision at the first. So that would be the first year of Belshazzar. Daniel's first personal vision. Okay. And I saw in the vision and there was me and I was in Shushan, the palace that was in Elam, the province. And I saw in the vision that I was upon the river Ulai. And I lifted up my eyes and I saw and behold, there stood one ram before the river and he had a pair of horns. Let's just take a look at what is Shushan, the palace, and the river Ulai. What is so significant about this? Okay, so this here shows uh, the Persian Gulf here. And this is Kuwait and Iraq. And Iran is up here. And this here is the Euphrates River going up. Th this is the Tigris River through here and the Euphrates going up this way. And they go all the way up into Syria. Now this river here, going up through here, is Ulai. 
the Ulai River right here. And this is Susa. That Shushan is Susa. And this is a the this was the capital of Elam, which was a country but at this time it was a province of Babylon. So D Daniel is here, he's in Susa on the river Eli. Still working for the king of Babylon, who is Babylon's over here just off the picture right about there somewhere. So he's still working for him, he's in Susa the puzzle. In Susa, the castle or the palace there. It's, it was like the Winter Palace. So now that we know where it is, here's another picture of it. There's Babylon, the Euphrates River right here, the Tigris River right there, and then here's the Ulai River and Susa the palace, Shushan, or Susa. So, so he's standing here and he's looking west and he's looking at the Ulai River. And the first beast, of course, is going to be Persia. So here's the interesting thing, is that Daniel, he's here on the river Ulai at Susa, and he's looking towards the river, looking west, and what's he looking towards? This is the, the beginnings of the Persian Empire. This is where Persia started from. So he's looking at this ram, and this is what the Persian Empire was at that time, or, or was about to be. Okay, so I lifted up my eyes, so he's looking across the river Ulai. I lifted up my eyes, and behold, there stood one ram before the river, and he had a pair of horns. And the pair of horns were high, but the first was higher than the second. And that's probably talking about uh, Cyrus the Great and then Darius or Darius the Second or Dar Darius the Great. Okay, so this is, this is the first. He's probably the older uh, Median. Dar Darius was a Mede. So he was older, but he came up second and he was greater. And now the later... I also put Western because this is one of those words in Hebrew that it came came up after, which is also behind. You see, in the Hebrew mind, there's a few different ways when when you're starting to look at direction. Now you see, in when the when the magnetic north was invented or or discovered in medieval times then with the age the age of enlightenment or whatever the magnetic north was was became uh like what it is for us north is up on the map uh north is is uh, the focus on when you're talking about locations but the hebrews had no idea about magnetic north so their directions were not focused on north. They, it was focused on the east because Abraham came from the east and went west. So the east represents the past and the east is in front of you because you can see the past and the future is behind you. You can't see the future. So the past is east and the, f the, the, the future is west. And the east is in front of you. The, pa the, the, pa the west is behind you. And now for east, there's two different uh, words used for east. One would be the rising of the sun, which is directly east. And the other would be east, meaning Babylon like meaning the past where Abraham came from uh, Ur so southern Mesopotamia that's east and west can be the setting of the sun or it can also be the sea the western sea the Mediterranean 
and north north there's just one word for north it's the north and south is Negev all right so here's a map of Israel and we can see this here this here's the West Bank right in this area Jerusalem's right about here and this is the map of Israel now this part here in red is called the Negev so this is a desert flat it's part of the Sinai Desert so it's flat desert and then right here you go up the mountains and in here you go up into the coastal plains but this is like a low flat area it's the Negev so they whenever they say Negev they can mean south the word south is Negev and then west is the Mediterranean Sea so they'll say the sea which means west the Negev which means south and even Daniel he's, he's using these words when he's in Susa the, I saw the ram okay and the second came up later now after would be after would be in the future or later which is also Western okay I saw the ram pushing seaward so that also westward as I just just explained the sea I saw the ram pushing towards the sea or westward and northward and southward Negev and all living could not stand before him and none could deliver from his hand and he did as he pleased and he became great now we know later from the interpretation of the angel later in the chapter this is talking about Persia so let's take a quick look at the Persian Empire map okay here's the Persian Empire now as we can see that he started here west of Susa Persis and he became great and he pushed westward and northward and southward Negev westward towards the sea southward towards Negev and beyond and northward which is this way up into here and I was considering and behold a he goat came from the west now this is a male goat and it's a very hairy goat now the west here the word he's using for the west here is place of the setting the the setting of the sun so it's, it's not this 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 is talking about Alexander the Great from Greece we know that later in the chapter the angel tells us directly the first two beasts are Persia and Greece so this is Alexander the Great now you'll notice that Alexander the Great came from here so, so he's not going to use the word the sea for west he's using the setting of the sun which is like beyond the sea or further over west so he came from over here from from the west this he goat and he came charging in straight at Persia and hit a he goat came from the west upon the face of all the earth not touching the land that means he came very fast and he he didn't establish his kingdom as he went he just kept on Alexander just kept on conquering he just kept conquering and conquering that was his whole career he didn't really um, stop and dom rule his dominion and then move on um, he just kept going so he was very fast and he came to the ram lord of the horns the two horns that's it says Baal Baal of the horns so that's like Lord this ram is the lord of the horns Medes and Persians okay 
that I had seen standing before the river, and he ran to him in power and anger. And I saw him strike beside the ram, and he was enraged against him, and he thrust the ram, and he broke the two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. And he threw him to the ground and trampled him. So he destroyed the Persian Empire, basically. And there was none that could deliver the ram from his hand. And the he-goat became very great. And when he was great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Alexander the Great died. And there came up from under it four conspicuous horns. Now conspicuous, that means they're, they're easy to see. They're easy to notice. They're, um, they're quite out there, conspicuous. And the conspicuous horns were towards the four winds of the heavens. So as we knew from last video, so here's a, here's a map of Alexander the Great's uh, travels. And he started here in Macedon, came through here, through here, down into Egypt, took over Egypt, went around through here, one did a loop, back up this way, straight through here, through here, right to Susa. Okay, so he took Babylon, took Susa, and then he moved in here and went you know, all through here and through here and through here. So he basically took the whole Persian Empire. One man by himself. <laughs> Look at the time. 334 to 323. That's the, that's the time of his kingdom. So it's basically nine years. Which is like incredible for nine years for a guy to take all of that empire all these battles that must that went on and of course this is the diadoshi the four generals the four main generals there were some other smaller ones but the four main generals who carved up alexander's empire the greatest one was um the Seleucid Empire, which is basically this uh, this part here. And then this is uh, the beginning of Ptolemic Egypt. Ptolemy was one of the generals. He ended up taking Egypt. And then over here, Macedon and, uh, and this center part is Lysimachy, Lys 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 Lysenius. But these two are the important ones for Bible prophecy that we're learning about. Because what happened was the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemic Egypt, they fought over Jerusalem back and forth. And uh, the Jews were kind of in Jerusalem here, stuck in the middle between these two empires fighting back and forth over land over who gets this part of the country. And out of these wars, when these two became weakened, out of these wars, there was a, one of the kings of the Seleucid Empire named Antiochus Epiphanes. He is the one who forced the Jews uh, to uh, become more like Greeks and to take on Greek religion. And he sacrificed pig's flesh on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, it, it started a, a revolution among the Jews called the Maccabees. And they threw him out and started their own kingdom. And, th and that kingdom grew quite large. We'll talk about that a bit later. But right now, this is the four horns that came up after the
great horn on the goat was broken. Okay, so now we're on this chapter. And from one of them, from one of those four, came out a little insignificant horn. So this is like in contrast to the conspicuous horns. So these horns are very great and very notable. This one, this little horn, is not very great and not very notable. Okay, he's the opposite. But he became exceedingly great to the south, to the Negev, and to the east, the sunrise, and to the glory. Now, what does that mean? In some translations, you'll see it um, translated as the glorious land. But it doesn't say land. And it doesn't say glorious. Glorious is an adjective. It's a noun. Glory. It's the glory. The, the, the glory of God. So it still kind of means Jerusalem. It still kind of means the temple. The, his power rose up to the glory of God. To, and, and against the glory of God. Is sort of what it's saying, right? So to the, to the south and to the east and to the glory. And he became great up to the host of heavens. The host would be like the army of heaven or all of the parts of heaven. And he caused to fall to the earth from the host and from the stars. And he trampled them. And up to the captain of the host, he made himself great. So he re reached as high as the captain of the host. And from him, the continual was lifted off, and the foundation of his holy place was thrown down. So what does this mean, the continual? And the host was given to her upon the continual and in rebellion and in rebellion and she threw the truth down to the ground and she acted and she was successful so this is an interesting part now when you're looking at hebrew the um, masculine and feminine third person masculine or feminine singular can be the masculine can be he or it can be it. It can be talking about an object. Okay? And the, the feminine singular can be she or it. So it's talking about an object. It's it. And if it's talking about a person, it's he or she. So I translated it this way because the interesting thing in this verse is it switches. You can say it all the way through, which is what most translators do. They just translate it, it, all the way through. But it switches from masculine until verse 12 is feminine. So it's a different it. So what this means to me is there was some kind of a morph morphing of this little horn, this little in insignificant horn. He became great, but he also morphed into a different it. Okay, so he, he came up to the captain of the host and made himself great. And from him, the continual was lifted off, and the foundation of his holy place was thrown down. So, Let's take a look at what, what does the continual mean. Okay, we see here in the Blue Letter Bible, this is the King James Version. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. So you see how they're assuming it's talking about the daily sacrifice. 
and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now this, I didn't translate this as sanctuary because this is Kodesh, Mikdesh, which means Kodesh is holy. Mikdesh makes it a noun or a place. So it's holy place, the holy place, I, I, that's what I said, which is the sanctuary. But this is here is the daily, right? The continual. So you click on here, Strong's number. This is a very powerful tool. Continuity. Outline of usage. Continuity. Continually. Continuously. And the Hebrew word is tamid. Um meaning to stretch a continuance, constant. There's a Brown Driver Briggs a lexicon. You can look in there. Show all, it'll show the whole entry for this word. Jesenius, another Hebrew lexicon. Perpetuate, perpetuity, continuance. Proceeding, going on. That's what this word is sort of means. Now, here's the important part that is very useful. Is every time this uh, appears in the sentence, it's showing all the places that this word is being used. And you shall sh set the table showbread before me always. That's that word, continually. Uh, for the... And Pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. Uh, a memorial before the Lord continually. Uh, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. So you can sort of see in the Torah how this is being used. The lamps burn continually uh, before the Lord continually. Now let's, usually what I'll do is I'll scroll down and, and look at some other uh, parts of the Bible. See if you look in Chronicles, right? As this is uh, Kings and Chronicles, how they're using it. Sweet incense for the continual showbread. Offer sacrifices continually before the Lord. Okay, happy are your men and happy are your servants which stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. I guess that's what the Queen of Sheba was saying to Solomon. So there, she's using it there. Uh, we can take a quick look here up into Ezra, Hosea. Let's take Ob. Let's look at Obadiah. Okay. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Oh, this might be even linked to our verse in Daniel, won't it? Yeah, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. Okay. There is no healing of your bruise. Your wound is grievous. All that bear the brute of you shall clap the hands over you. For upon whom has not thy wickedness passed continually? Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? So you see this, is, this word isn't only used about the sanctuary. I have set the Lord always, continually, always, before me, because he is at my right hand. My eyes are continually towards the Lord. Okay. The Psalms. I am ready to heart. My sorrow is continually before me. Um, so you get the idea of how that word is being used. And that's what this is. And, and the daily sacrifice, that's how they translate it. But it's the continual. It's a noun, masculine, singular. So it's the, the continual. They call it the daily. But even that isn't really um, 
accurate because it's not once each day. Daily kind of says once each day. The, the word is continual, continually. So the continual. Something was constant. Some, some um, Bibles translate it as constant. The constant was taken away. Now, it, it allures to the daily uh, temple service, the continual service in the temple. Okay? But it doesn't justify translating that word as daily sacrifice. Okay? And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, here also is the continual was taken away. This word here, room, was taken away. So this is a hyphil perfect third masculine singular. So we take a look here. And it says, okay, we've got to look here under the type of word it is. It's a hyphil. To raise, to lift up, to take up, to erect, exalt, set on high, lift up. Now, it also means, um, in a few places you'll see, like, to lift up the yoke from you. Um, so that's like to lift off. So lift up or lift off, to take away, remove, right? So that's the sense that this word is showing. Lift up or to take off. So you kind of get the idea of what that word is about. He caused the host and stars to fall. This is the falling of angels. Okay. And the host of heaven and the stars. He trampled them. He caused them to fall and he trampled them. And he even raised himself up to the captain of the host. So he made himself a rival of the captain of the host of heaven. <laughs> and from him, now this is the thing, from him, who? From the captain of the host? The continual was lifted off? The continual burnt offerings? The continual lamp in the temple? That's what this is talking about. So from him, it, is it talking about the captain of the host? Or is it talking about the horn? Or is it talking about both, either of them? From him, because Jesus was, was crucified and raised from the dead, and he said of the temple that it, it, not a stone shall be left upon a stone that shall not be thrown down. And that the, the destruction of the temple is directly related in Christianity. It's directly related to the crucifixion of Christ. And the, the curtain of the temple was rent in two. And uh, so the sacrifices in the temple are no longer re required because the ultimate sacrifice has been made of Jesus on the cross. So this is the lifting off of the continual and the foundation of the holy place thrown down. The, the, the foundation doesn't necessarily mean the foundation stones. It, it could be um, um, just talking about the, the foundation as, as the temple being the foundation of the religion. It's, it's on a, built upon a different foundation because Jesus is the foundation stone. Upon this stone I will build my church. Um, I will lay a stone in Zion. I will lay a rock in Zion, a stumbling stone, and a foundation stone. So the foundation has been changed and the continual offering has been changed. Okay? From him, the continual and the foundation of the holy place was thrown down. And a host was given to her. Now here's the, where it changes. Her, 
Him would be a kingdom. Her would be a church. So this is a kingdom changing into a church. The, the, the woman rides the beast. Um, the woman went into the wilderness and she comes out riding a beast. And she went in as a pure woman. She came out as a harlot riding a beast. So, you know, you, you, this is sort of interesting how this switches to, fe to feminine. Okay, this is uh, called Bible Hub. It's a pretty cool tool for Bible. Um, I use it for um, comparing all the other translations of a certain verse. It's very handy for that. You just use this here. You switch it to parallel, which I have it already. And it, it's a bit of a lag to switch to get things to come out, to come up. But I got it on Daniel chapter eight, verse nine. And so now it's going to show all the different translations of this verse, right? New International Version. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and to the beautiful land. So here's the important verse now. King James Bible. Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So this is the continual and the holy place, the place of his sanctuary, okay? So what's New International? It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. Okay, that's accurate. A little bit off, a little bit translated over, but it's accurate. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord. See, this is over translated. It doesn't say that. It challenged the commander of heaven's army by canceling the daily sacrifices offered to him. So you can see how the King James translation gets carried over into other translations because when they're translating a Bible, they want to compete with the other Bibles. So they don't want to say the continual. It just doesn't make any sense to people. So they have to say, well, what is it? It's the daily sacrifices, which kind of makes sense and probably is. But it, all it says is the continual. See, it even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host and it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. So it's interesting to sometimes to look at all these translations to see how they handle it. Especially if you understand the Hebrew. This is how I translate it, which is a literal translation. And up to the captain of the host he made himself great. And, and I try to stick to with the sentence structure as much as possible. Like it's impossible to stick to the Hebrew sentence structure because the verb, subject, object is switched around. But I try to keep to it as close as I can. Okay. And up to the captain of the host, he made himself great. And from him, the continual was lifted off and the foundation of his holy place was thrown down. So from who? From the, from the captain of the host or from the horn? Or both? You see, Jesus, he was crucified on the cross. And because of that, the daily sacrifice ended. Okay? And... The, you know, because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice in Christianity. Now, from a Jewish perspective, they're ta they would be talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. We're going to look at the history and, and, and dig into this more, but I'm just sort of showing you some of the options in interpreting this. Okay? So, from who? From both? So, you can also 
interpret this as Rome, because Rome destroyed the temple. And Rome ended the daily sacrifice. Antiochus Epiphanes, he ended it for a year or two, or three and a half years, they say. and But then it was reopened and started again. But the Romans ended it from him. The daily was lifted off, taken, the yoke is lifted. You see? That's how that word is used in other place, in, in the Psalms I, or in the prophets. I will lift the yoke off. And the foundation of his holy place was thrown down. Now, Jesus said of the temple, not a stone shall be left upon a stone. So, Jesus could be the one who did this, and Rome could also be the one who did this. You see? Uh, from him, who? The horn, or the captain, or from both of them? from this war between the horn and the captain, the daily sacrifice or the continual offerings was lifted off and the foundation of the holy place was thrown down. Because the, Jesus is the foundation stone. I, behold, I will lay a, a stone in Zion. It will be a stumbling stone and a foundation stone. That's Jesus. So the foundation of the temple was thrown down. So you can look at it a few different ways. And the Jews will also look at it from a perspective of Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, about a couple, 100 B a BC or so that um, he, he offered pig's flesh on the altar and he... Uh, um, forbade the Jews from using the temple for uh, three and a half years and then they reconsecrated the temple. They rebelled and reconsecrated the temple. So we can look at it many ways here. Um, we're going to look deeper into the history and figure this out. Okay. Now I want to see how the other Bibles translate this next verse. Because now he becomes a she. Okay. And a host was given to her upon the continual. So an army or a whole setup, a, a, a hierarchy was given to her based on the continual, based on the continual offering. And in rebellion, rebellion also means transgression, like transgression of God's law is rebellion to God's law, rebellion of God's government, you see. So that's what that word is connected to. It's in transgression or rebellion. She threw down the truth, down to the ground, and she acted and she was successful. Okay, so um, she as opposed to he. He is a kingdom. She is a religion, a church. Now, speaking from a prophetic terms. So I'd like to see how this is translated in other Bibles. Verse 12. So this is the verse where it's feminine. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did because they're trying to stay. It's still the horn, and it is still that little horn. It is that little horn, but he is now a she. So it, it transformed into a different it. When it picked up, it took the daily sacrifice and it transformed into a church. Okay? The army of heaven was restrained from responding to this rebellion. How, what the hell? How did they get that from? So the daily sacrifice was halted and truth was overthrown. The horn succeeded in everything it did. 
That's way over translating it. Here's the King James. A host was given him, is not him, against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. By reason of, that's not in there. That's not in the Hebrew. And it cast down truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So this last part is accurate. The first part, it doesn't say daily sacrifice. It doesn't say against. They're just assuming things. So let's look back at my translation and see literally what it says. Verse 12. And a host was given to her upon the continual. Or because of the continual. or it's, This word is usually upon. It's over, over the continual. Um, and in rebellion or transgression, she threw truth down to the ground. So she took up the daily sacrifice, but trampled truth to the ground. That's the point of this sentence. Okay? And a host was given to her. Not the host, a host. And she acted and she was successful. She prospered. And so this is the end of the vision. Okay? And I heard a holy one speaking, and the holy one said to a certain one that was speaking, Until when is the vision, the continual, and the rebellion of desolation? To give the holy host to be trampled. And he said to me, Until 2,300 evenings and mornings, and the holy will be justified. Okay? So the way this verse is often translated is uh, 2,300 days. Because an evening... And a morning is one day in Genesis chapter 1. But it says, you know, we, we don't have a right to translate that as days. It says 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now this is the evening sacrifice and the morning sacrifice. So that could be 1,150 days, right? An evening and a morning for each day. 1150 days would be 2300 evenings and mornings. I don't know, but it could be, right? So that's what it says until 2300 evenings and mornings. The holy will be justified. The holy, this is a noun. All that is holy, or what is holy will be justified. So how do these other Bibles translate this? King James Version, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Uh, New International, until it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. 2300 evenings and mornings, then the temple will be made right again. So why did I translate it the way I did? 2300 evenings and mornings, and the holy will be justified. Because that's exactly what it says. I, I, they're assuming the temple will be cleansed. But it, it ac actually says the holy, a noun, the holy, will be justified. Okay, let's take a look here. Daniel chapter 8, 14. Look in the Hebrew here. The sanctuary will be cleansed. This is the King James up here, English. But right here, this, these two words, okay? This is Kodesh. It's a noun, and it means holy. The holy. That's all it means. 
apartness, holiness, sacredness, separatedness, kodesh. It means holy. It means a sacred thing, a sacred place. Um, it's often translated as holy. We'll see here. Okay. And in the first day sh there shall be a holy convocation. And the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation. It's sanctified. It's sacred. Um, unto thy holy habitation. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath. You see, so everywhere is holiness. And shall hollow all their holy gifts. Uh, minister in the holy place. This is two words, right? It's uh, Kodesh Makom, holy place. And he put the holy crown upon the mitre. So see, it's often used as holy. It means holy. So holy what? It's holy. What is holy? This is. Nifel is passive tense. It, sh it was done. Okay. And what is it? Cleansed. Now what is this word? Sadak. Sadiq means righteous. Sadak. Righteous. Just. To have to be right. To be just. To be justified. To be just with God. To be nifal. This is the passive sense. To be justified. To be made right. Okay. Sadiq means righteousness. This is a, a form of that word. Be right. To be straight. So how is it used? I will not justify the wicked. Uh, then they shall justify the righteous. Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Um, how then can a man be justified with God? There's Job. Psalms. And enter not into thy judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no living be justifi justified. He that justifies the wicked and he that condemns the just, they are both an abomination. So that it means justified. Okay? So that's why I translated it that way. Because that's what it says. So this is why I felt like I needed to retranslate this whole thing. Um, not not that the other translations are necessarily wrong, but they're not literal enough. Because if we're getting deep into prophecy, we have to literally know what it says. We don't need other people telling us what it means. We want to know what it says. It says until 2,300 evenings and mornings, and the holy will be justified. Because it might not be talking about the temple. Because we're Christians. Right? We're, we're thinking about Jesus. And, the, and, and what was... What did this she do that threw down... She took the continual offerings. The continual. The, 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 the temple service. This is very much connected to the temple service. It's continual offerings... The continual candle light. This. Okay. And in re rebellion. So not according to God's law. But against God's law. She threw truth down to the ground. So a lot of deception going on. And she acted and was successful. Okay. And, and, and so what needs to happen to correct this. The holy needs to be justified because we need the truth to be risen back up from being thrown down and trampled right and we need the continual the the service to god to be restored to its rightful place 
and then the holy will be justified. Okay, so, you know, we'll, we'll look more into the historical events and try to pin this down more. But we're just getting a, a, a good sense of what this is talking about. Okay? And it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought understanding. And behold, there stood before me as a vision a strong man. Now this here strong man, that um, just means a man a, uh, old enough for military service or a man capable, right? An able-bodied man. And I heard the voice of a man within the Ulai, the river, right? And he called out and said, Gabriel, make him understand the vision. And he came, so De Gabriel came, near where I stood. And when he came, I was terrified and I fell on my face. And he said to me, Understand, son of man, that at the time of the end is the vision. So this vision is for the time of the end. Now this here makes a lot of uh, scholars say that Daniel is an uh, unfulfilled, failed prophecy because it was about Antiochus Epiphanes and the end didn't come. Um, and so they say, well, it was written after that time by a Jew who's just trying to make Antiochus look bad. But we know different. We know that this is actually Daniel. And he's talking about other things. And he's talking about the time of the end. Okay? So this prophecy, this 2300-day period... It could be 2,300 years. It's, it's a day is a year in prophecy. Uh, it could be, you know, this goes up to the time of the end. It's got to be 2,300 years because we're well past 1,150 years. Um, this, this time that evil reigns and the holy is not justified. Like, there's a lot of people who understand God but there's a lot of deception out there still. So I wouldn't say yet. But possibly. We'll see. That's This is still up in the air. What does this mean? Okay. So he said, um, for the end, the time of the end is the vision. And when he was speaking with me, I became fast asleep on my face to the ground and he touched me and he caused me to stand upright and he said to me behold I will cause you to know what will be in the end of wrath this is God's um, repaying of sin okay because to an appointed time is the end so the end is happening at an appointed time okay and appointed times are connected to the holy days of God. Like the Passover is, the, is an appointed time. Uh, that was the crucifixion of Christ. The Pentecost was an appointed time. 40, 40 days after the Passover, that was the giving of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Um, and there's other appointed times. The Feast of Trumpets and the um, Atonement Day. The Atonement Day is the 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 is like the reconsecration of the temple. It, that's the holy being justified. Atonement Day, and that is like the second coming of Christ. The Feast of the Trumpets announces the coming of the Atonement. So that's what appointed times are about. So the wrath because to an appointed time is the end. The ram you saw, the lord of the pair of horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. The hairy goat is the king of Javan. Now Javan is the Hebrew word and it means Greece or 
the Aegean Sea, basically the the Greek the Greek islands, the Greek people, okay. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king, the first king of that invades from Greece, Alexander the Great. And the broken and the four stood up from under it are the four kingdoms from the nation that will stand up, but not in his power. So because Alexander died and the four generals uh, stood up and, and divided his kingdom into four, right? And in the end of their kingdom, so, so at, the, at, the, at the end of the kingdom of these four, is completed as the transgressors are complete okay a king will stand up of fierce countenance and it says uh, in his face fierceness in his face okay fierce countenance understanding riddles this uh, the King James calls this dark sentences, but it really means riddles, okay? So he's understanding riddles or understanding maybe things about people. And he will be mighty in power, but not by his power. So he will have a mighty power, but it's not his power. And extraordinarily he will corrupt and destroy and prosper and act. And he will destroy numerous and holy people. So it doesn't matter to him who who's, he's destroying them both. The num numerous people and, and including holy people. And upon his discretion he will cause deceit to prosper in his hand. So everything he does will be deceitful. And in his heart he shall become great. So a lot of pride. And by peace he shall destroy many. That's like America bringing peace, right? <laughs> to Iraq. <laughs> like that kind of peace. Okay. And he shall stand against the captain of captains. This here would be to Christians. This would be Jesus. The, he's the the chief cap, the chief of all the captains. Okay, and in the end, his hand shall be broken. So he will no longer be able to do anything. Okay, and the vision of the evening and the morning that was told, it is true, and you. Hide the vision because it is in many days. Now, I translated this as hide. Um, what it really is, how it is used is uh, the well was stopped up. You know, Abraham digged the well and they stopped it up. It, it, um, um, plugged up. So, plug up the vision. Stop up the vision. That's sort of like that. It's being used. That's what that word is. How that word is used. I just said hide. Because it is in many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was weak. Now the King James says I was sick. But it could mean sick or weak. I think if he was sick, he wouldn't be doing work for the king. Um, so I, I fainted and was weak for days. And I arose and did the work of the king. And I was horrified by the vision. And I was not understanding. I didn't understand it. Like how can he hide the vision. <laughs> if he doesn't even know what it means. Like, So this is part of the narrative of the book of Daniel. This is the second vision he's had. Which is related to this vision. To the first vision. Which was in t chapter 7. The four beasts upon the great sea um, and he still doesn't understand so the, the next chapters coming in Daniel are coming to help Daniel understand this 
So um, I think this is uh, good enough for this video, and then the next video will carry on, and we'll look at more of um, some of the histories. Like there's a few historical events. There's actually about a hundred or two hundred years of history that are very much tied in with this prophecy and on how this all starts. And, and, and it gives us about three or four characters who we could be looking at um, that could possibly be involved in, in what this prophecy is about. And what I'm thinking is, okay, the Jews would agree Antiochus Epiphanes. Jews and scholars, they tend to think it's about him. But I would say... We could also be looking at Herod the Great or the, or the entire Herodian dynasty as a power, the insignificant power. And we could be looking at the Maccabees, the Hasmonean dynasty. We could be looking at the Rome. Rome, Rome was very involved in the Herodian dynasty. And we could be looking at Jesus. So it's Rome and Jesus and how is this sacrifice thrown down for 2,300 days? And how is this, um, uh, the holy ones thrown down from heaven and trampled upon and truth is, is trampled and all of these things. Um, we can't just interpret it from just this. What we have to do is read, go look further at the rest of the book of Daniel because there is another two more visions and we have to take all four of them and then start looking at it. So I hope this is um, intriguing to you as it is to me. And I'm kind of learning this myself right now as I go. I've been studying this prophecy for years but I've never been able to read Hebrew before. So now I'm looking at the Hebrew and digging in a bit deeper. And it's amazing what you find with the Hebrew and how translators over the years have borrowed from each other and over-translated things. Uh, we need a literal translation for this. Otherwise, you're just being misled. You're being told what it means. And it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, and I think this is kind of, it's kind of maybe a little um, duplicitous on purpose. It's, it's talking about two people or it's talking about either or and things like that. So, um, in the next video, we're going to continue on looking at the rest of Daniel. And when we look at it all, then we'll be able to make some better determinations about what this is really about. Uh, I hope I've perked your interest up on it. It's, this is par probably some of the most fascinating parts of the Bible, this Daniel, the second half of Daniel. So... And um, if you're going to look at Revelation, you, you shouldn't even think about um, interpreting Revelation unless you've figured out Daniel. It's very, they're very much tied in together. So that ends this video, and I will see you next time. And also, I'm kind of busy lately I have a few I have a I'm self-employed I have a, a few things on the go and we got snow now in Vancouver <laughs> and um, there's just a lot going on and I'm also um, taking uh, online classes and so my videos might not necessarily be every week but it'll be a week and a half between them or a week I'll, I try to do them every week 
But um, when I have to do this translating and all these other things for the video, then it's really difficult for me to get it all done in a week because I have so many other things going on. So we'll see you next video. And don't forget to should subscribe and like and share. Uh, it helps a lot. So thank you very much.